Welcome to Magic Arcanum. I'm Ryan Gomez. Behind the scenes is Nicole Burdick, and we're so glad you're here because it's story time. Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is Magic's first, and probably not last, set inspired by Dungeons and Dragons, but cards representing these iconic winged creatures have been present in the game from day one. It doesn't matter if you come from the land of the D20 or of the Spin Down, because today we're going to take a look back at a history of dragons in Magic the Gathering. But first, every adventurer needs to be properly equipped, from weapons to underwear. So I have a quest for you. Use the link down below to check out Into the AM. There, you'll find everything you need from eye-popping graphic tees to subtle yet tasteful basics like this one, all tailor-fitted and made with premium quality materials. And you wouldn't want to face down a dragon without your lucky underwear, right? So grab a bundle of their everyday boxer briefs. They've got a plus five against discomfort. And they make your adventuring gear look like top tier loot. Use that link in the description and you'll even save 10% on your entire purchase while supporting the channel, which Nicole and I really appreciate. Okay, let's talk dragons. We'll begin with a basic anatomy lesson. The dragons of magic traditionally have four limbs and two wings, which makes them different from drakes, who only have two limbs in addition to their wings. Dragons also come in a wider variety of sizes than drakes, starting with their appearance on two cards in the game's very first set. That would be Dragon Whelp and Shivan Dragon. Together, they established red as being the color of dragons and gave them a key part of their mechanical identity, which we refer to today as fire breathing. Notice how both the whelp and the adult dragon can spend red mana to increase their power. Well, you could also enchant another creature to do that using a card literally called fire breathing. And guess what showed up in the art? So from the very start, dragons could deal huge amounts of damage in the air while going wing to wing against the angels, demons, and elementals from the other colors. And speaking of other colors, it did not take long for the dragons to spread their wings beyond just red. Legends from 1994 introduced us to the Elder Dragons, each a three-colored flying 7-7 with an upkeep cost, and in the case of Nicol Bolas, a mean stack of library books. Also, also note that Vevictus Asmati has fire breathing that can use red, black, or green mana. These guys would eventually be the foundation of a format called Elder Dragon Highlander, which you might know by its other name, Commander. Nalathni Dragon was contentious when it first came out, not because of its power level, but because it was exclusively available at a convention called Dragon Con held in Atlanta. Even in the game's earliest days, players recognized the problematic nature of making mechanically unique cards only attainable by a select audience. Wizards of the Coast eventually agreed and reprinted this card as a more widely accessible promo, and they promised they had learned the error of their ways. I'll let you decide if that's still true. Anyway, Mirage also had a cycle of dragons, one for each color, all costing a total of six mana. The green one is kind of clever in that it has trample, but can trade that off for the ability to jump, because green doesn't usually get flying creatures. Out of these, one would go on to be reprinted several more times, and that's Volcanic Dragon, which has become a pretty regular inclusion in core sets. Mirage also gave us Crimson Hellkite, which had a bit of a twist on the fire-breathing mechanic. It could aim it at a specific creature, rather than just pump its own power for attacking or blocking. Let me take this opportunity to remind you that the goal of this video is not to cover every dragon. There's over 230 of them, so that would be impossible. Instead, I'm just trying to point out the ones that I think show the creature's history and evolution since the game began. Pointing out the ones that I missed in the comments is not the flex that you think it is. With that said, let's jump ahead to Urza's Saga block, first to look at Shivan Hellkite. This dragon had another version of fire breathing, possibly the best one yet, because you could now aim it at creatures or players, and you didn't even have to attack to get the damage in. Seven mana for a 5-5 was pretty expensive though, especially in a block known for being one of the most overpowered of all time. That's why I also want us to look at Covetous Dragon. 
Any card that winds up in the World Championship deck for one of the best Magic players ever has to be pretty good, right? Covetous Dragon is also an early example of Magic exploring the idea of a dragon hoarding treasure, which is a staple of fantasy stories from The Hobbit to Harry Potter. Invasion gave us another cycle of five legendary dragons. While their stats weren't quite as big as their elder predecessors, they lacked an upkeep cost, and instead they had activated abilities that looked for cards or permanents of a chosen color. Draco from Plane Shift holds the honor of having the game's highest black-bordered casting cost, even beating the Eldrazi. Still dies to a bunch of squirrels, though. Vampiric Dragon from Odyssey borrowed a few tricks from the Sengir bloodline. It was one of the first dragons to have a second non-elder creature type, which would remain pretty rare. And while they are few and far between, my next dragon of history also happens to be dual-typed as a dragon nightmare. World Gorger Dragon forms an infinite combo with Animate Dead, allowing you to loop your lands and other creatures for endless mana and enters the battlefield triggers. By this point, dragons were pretty firmly red in the color pie, but Scourge let white have another crack at it, uh, outside of the cycles in later sets. Eternal Dragon would then go on to inspire Timeless Dragon from Modern Horizons 2. Kamigawa provided us with another cycle of legendary dragons, this time also spirits, each with an ability that triggered on their own death. This was an interesting cycle to me because each creature is a flying 5-5 five five and they all cost a total of 6 mana, but require different amounts of colored mana. The red and blue ones are easiest to cast, presumably because those are the colors that get the most dragons. And green is the hardest because they're not really supposed to have flying creatures, so I guess they wanted to make you put in some work for it. Also, notice how these dragons don't have wings, or even limbs, really. They're more serpentine, as befitting their Eastern cultural influences. Our first visit to Ravnica gave us Niv Mizzet, founder of the Plains Is It League. He became a very popular character over the years, eventually appearing on four different legendary creature cards, which I believe is a record, but it wouldn't be Magic Arcanum without somebody challenging me in the comments. Scion of the Ur-Dragon was the game's first five-colored dragon, and its legendary status makes it a popular commander choice today. As for the actual Ur-Dragon, well, it would take about 10 more years for them to appear as one of the face cards for Commander 2017. The Ur-Dragon is something of an oddity within the Magic Multiverse. It is able to travel across planes, but it is not a planeswalker. It can create new dragons, but it does so without the help of any sort of partner, making it both the father and mother to its own offspring. We know for sure that some of its dragon children include the elder and primeval dragons of Dominaria, but it is also said that the spirit of the Ur-Dragon flows through all dragons. This would also include the legendary dragons from Planar Chaos, which occupied the wedge color combinations, in contrast to the earlier shard siblings from Invasion. And, speaking of shards, our visit to Alara gave us the Dragons of Jund, where they are the top of the food chain. In fact, the Hellkite overlords found here are some of the most powerful dragons in the entire multiverse, possessing classic fire breathing, but also the ability to regenerate, all contained on a flying, hasty, trampling 8-8 frame. Karthus, Tyrant of Jund, might be a little smaller, but it's fine because your opponent won't be able to deploy any Hellkites against him anyway. He'll just add them to your side of the battlefield, allowing you to rule the skies uncontested. Now we come to the era of the core set, which Wizards of the Coast would begin to use as both the on-ramp for new players entering the game, as well as a place to print classic representations of their most iconic creatures, like angels, demons, sphinxes, Hydras, and yes, dragons. M11 gave us two. Ancient Hellkite is bigger than a Shivan dragon, but it lacks the ability to increase its own power through fire breathing. Instead, it can perform a sort of strafing run against defending creatures whenever it attacks. Hoarding Dragon is a bit smaller, but comes with a flavorful form of card advantage. When it enters the battlefield, you get to search your library for an artifact and exile it. Then, when the dragon dies, you get to put the exiled card into your hand. So this was a fun way of discouraging your opponent from messing with your flying threat, because the treasure it's guarding could end up being an even bigger problem for them. 
The battle for Mirrodin found dragons on both sides. Steel Hellkite has colorless fire breathing and the ability to destroy non-land permanents outright. But I think the one most people tend to remember first is actually Scytherix, a dragon completed by the Phyrexians. In place of fire breathing, Skittles here has Infect, which is arguably much more punishing, especially when backed up with the ability to regenerate. Out of the 230-something dragons in the game to date, just shy of a dozen have been artifacts, including Molten Steel Dragon. This was another one fighting for Team Phyrexia, and had fire breathing powered by their corrupted mana. This gave the dragon a sort of channel fireball feeling that I thought was kind of neat. Phantasmal Dragon from M12 gave you a 5-5 flyer for just 4 mana, with the drawback of it being extremely vulnerable to any sort of spell or ability, because those would dispel the illusion. This is the side of blue that I really like, mind games that aren't all about counterspells and permission. This card and its cousins force your opponent to be the one with answers for a change, and any time you can turn the game on its head like that, I think you can have a lot of fun. M12 also gave us Furyborn Hellkite, which I put in a deck along with Geosurge and Goblin Arsonist. Attack with the Goblin, and almost no matter what your opponent does, you're getting a 12-12 on turn 4? As the flavor text tells us, the Moonvale Dragons of Innistrad are somewhat benevolent. They prey upon vampires and werewolves, and seeing one in person is considered a good omen if you're a human. The fact that they share their fire breathing with all creatures you control makes them a valuable ally as well. Slumbering Dragon from M13 is one that I remember my local game store just could not keep in stock. I don't think it was a super competitive card, but it is a charming one, capturing the classic Sleepy Dragon from Fantasy. We had seen this idea all the way back in Legends with Elder Landworm, which eventually got retroactively made into a dragon, but it was nice to see it executed on a red card with modern design sensibility. Dragons are the iconic red big creature, but I like how the game also devotes cards to showing them at smaller sizes, like Dragon Egg and Dragon Hatchling. Angels can kind of get away with this too, and a lot of Hydras have X in their cost, and they can be any size, but I wish Demons and Sphinxes got a bit more widespread representation like this. One other advantage dragons have is that they can show up more easily in other colors, and this was put to the test in Tarkir block, home to more dragons than any block before it. Appearing in every color and at every rarity, the dragons flooded the skies of the plain, but the real stars of the show were the legendary dragons, who we got to see twice. Thanks to Ugin helping Sarkhan with some casual time travel, they were able to upgrade themselves from mere legends into elder dragons, and became the self-appointed dragonlord rulers of the plain. As of right now, Tarkir is home to, like, one out of every five dragons in all of magic, which is pretty impressive. Glorybringer from Amonkhet is a well-oiled machine, design-wise. It can use the Exert mechanic to deal four damage to a non-dragon creature, and that is to prevent a scenario in which you feel bad for playing your Glorybringer first, only to have it knocked out of the sky by an opponent's. It also might be because Nicol Bolas just flat out didn't want the dragons on this plane turning against him. But we can say that's my Lazatep foil hat theory. Anyway, M19 gave us updated versions of the original Elder Dragons, plus a transforming Nicol Bolas that captures his spark igniting on Dominaria thousands of years ago. These dragons also no longer have the same casting cost nor power and toughness. Each dragon has been given room to be a bit more specialized, which I think tells their stories a lot better. Except for Palladium Moors, who's just the worst. I don't know what's going on there. Let's skip ahead to Eldraine, a plane inspired by gingerbread men. Note that none of the dragons here have an ability like fire breathing. Instead, they appear to be more thoughtful and less prone to emotional outbursts, despite existing in a region of the plane known as the Wilds. Make no mistake, these dragons are still ferocious, as their flavor text states, but there does seem to be a lot of blue mana here cooling their tempers as well. Just saying. Ikoria is a land known for its behemoths, but the dragons we've seen here so far have been very small. They do make excellent targets for mutations, though. I gotta give them that. M21 put Fire Breathing back on display and gave us Terror of the Peaks, who has another bit of new red technology I like to call too hot to handle. 
Recently, we've seen this on Bone Crusher Giant and Tectonic Giant. The idea is that these creatures have a built-in punishment for being targeted with spells. And I think this works great when put on a dragon, because it really captures their whole don't mess with me attitude. Leyline Tyrant from Zendikar Rising has a delayed version of fire breathing. He lets you store up all your red mana and then fire it off when he dies. Amazingly, you can get a playset of this guy for the price of one Terror of the Peaks right now, and he's got another year before rotation, so maybe somebody out there can find a way to use his mana floating ability to good effect before then. The dragons of Kaldheim are kind of small compared to some of the cosmic threats that they share their plane with, anyway. Goldspan Dragon is another twist on the dragons care about treasure trope, and the Predator is our second ever vampire dragon, so that's progress. Now, Nicole already left a note on the script to remind me to mention that, yes, all changelings are also vampire dragons, so we'll be able to tell in the comments who actually watched the whole video. Strixhaven came with yet another cycle of legendary elder dragons, but this time, for me, they were a miss, man. I would have preferred that they kept the focus on the school, and each of these designs could have been given to a dean or a faculty member. It just felt like they really wanted to force five dragons into the set, and they didn't even have that much to do in the story. And now we come nearly full circle. Modern Horizons 2 gave us Arcbound Whelp, a modular nod to the Furnace Whelp, of Fifth Dawn, and Piru the Volatile is another Elder Dragon from Magic's earliest days of storytelling. That brings us to Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, which boasts over a dozen new dragons, once again at every rarity and appearing in every color. Inferno of the Star Mounts carries the fire-breathing torch set alight by Shivan Dragon almost 30 years ago, and Tiamat gives fans of the tribe another five-color commander with which they can rule the skies, at least over their kitchen table. You'll find them in scales of every color, from white to blue to black to green, but they'll always be red at heart. The dragons of magic have flown ever proudly since the game's earliest days, and now they face the next generation of adventurers brave enough to enter their dungeons. But what about you? Which dragon is your favorite in all of magic? Let me know down in the comments, and I might even toss you a $25 gift card for Into the AM so you can pick out a pair of lucky dragon slaying boxer shorts. Then make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the great stories you'll only find here on Magic Arcanum. We'll see ya.